um, and the description is that the NASA will pay a will play a vital role in the development of the commercial space sector. But what exactly can they do for commercial space? What do they plan to get from helping private companies? Leaders from some of the biggest NASA locations come together to give answers to these questions and discuss current developments at their at their centers. The potential for government commercial partnerships and what role they see their centers playing in the future of commercial space. Uh, the moderator for today's panel is Rebecca Kaiser, or Rebecca Spike Kaiser, some people know her by, who is the Associate Deputy Administrator for Policy Integration at NASA. Thank you all. As, I, as we assemble our panel here, um, I'll just say a few opening remarks. Um, we are so privileged to have uh, center directors and deputy directors here, and to me this is a great sign for the importance of commercial space that we have such a prolific showing here uh, at, at this conference. I would like to draw your attention to a publication that just came out uh, that was published by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, called Space Economy at a Glance 2011. And in this publication, they do talk quite a bit about commercial space. Um, specifically, they say that there's been a growth in space-related entrepreneurial activity in the space industry, particularly in the United States. Despite the economic crisis, there are many companies pursuing the development of new commercial space operations, vying to transport cargo and passengers in suborbital and or orbital flights. The total investment committed to the commercial space flight es uh, industry is estimated at $1.46 billion in 2009 with over $300 million in new commitments since January of 2008. And th this investment is made up of 15% government money, 15%. 50% comes from what they call angel investors, 30% from private en equity, and 5% from reinvestment. So, in my view, we're getting quite a bit of bang for our buck for 15% uh, government investment. And I think the future is growing and is quite bright. We have our centers here because this is where the rubber meets the road. Our partnerships are formed quite often at our NASA centers. This is where they're doing the real work. This is where they're going out and formulating these partnerships. And I think the fact that we have four directors and, and deputy directors here shows that this really is an active and important activity at each of these centers. So I would like to introduce on our far left, Bob Cabana, who is the director of Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We have Gene Goldman, who is the deputy director of Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. We have Steve Jerzyk, who is the Deputy Director of Langley Research Center in Virginia. And we have Pete Warden, who is the Director of Ames Research Center right here. The way we're going to structure this panel is I'm going to ask a series of questions. I encourage you all also to uh, submit questions, and I'll intersperse them with the questions that I ask. And we're going to focus again on the activities and efforts that are happening at the centers to enhance commercial partnerships. So I'd like to start out by asking a question to all of our panelists, and I'll go down the line, by first introducing what are the two to three main goals you have for your center in the next five to ten years overall. And I'd like to start with Bob. Well, I think now that uh, we've safely flown out the shuttle, uh, the main goal at the Kennedy Space Center is to transform to a multi-user launch complex. You know, we've been very dependent uh, upon large government programs in the past, Apollo, Skylab, Shuttle, and uh, inherent within each of those programs with all the infrastructure, the engineering support, everything, uh, and it was all paid for by that one program, and that kind of covered the whole center. Uh, as we move to the future, you know, what we have to look at is, you know, what do we want to be? What, do we, what can we do to enable commercial space? And 
Our goal is to enable commercial space and be a multi-user spaceport where we have a, a strong center with a good engineering team and uh, a ground ops team that can support multiple programs. It can support NASA's heavy lift program as well as multiple users out in Launch Complex 39. Uh, I think that is, uh, it's a huge challenge when you've had people that are so dependent on doing things one way. And what I told my team, you know, is that, uh, you know, in order to do something better, you have to change. And nobody likes change. They like, they like what they have. So uh, I think the, the goal that I have, that we have as a center, and it's a NASA goal, and that's to enable commercial space operations. We have to make it work. You can argue, um, you know, that you may have wanted to do something different, or you might not have done what we did to get to where we are, or we're not doing the right thing, but the bottom line is we are where we are. And what happened in the past, we can't deal with that. We have to deal with where do we need to be in the future. And uh, right now, uh, th that's getting a capability to get crews to the International Space Station and not have to rely on our uh, Russian partners to do it with uh, uh, a U.S. rocket and a U.S. team. And that's what uh, the Commercial Crew Development Program is all about. So what we're working on at KSC is putting the infrastructure in, sp in place that will support and enable those commercial operations as well as uh, NASA's heavy lift exploration program, and the two are not mutually exclusive. They're compatible. They're very compatible, and we can make that work. So th that's the main goal we got right now. And then you got to throw in, you know, while well, we still got the launch services program, it's critical to procuring our uh, uh, rockets for our scientific payloads. Uh, we got one coming up here on August 5th, Juno, to, uh, to Jupiter. And uh, at the end of the year, well, you got GRAIL, and then we got uh, the Mars Science Lab. So you know, we want to continue to maintain the success we've had there. And, uh, and then you can throw on top of that uh, getting the ground infrastructure in place to support the uh, space launch system and the multi-purpose crew vehicle. So uh, those are the three goals that we have at KSC. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. Gene. I'll build some on what Bob said, but making that transformation and doing it effectively is, is the big goal at our center, preserving the workforce that we have and the capability not only as civil servant, but the contractor capability that we have in the community for propulsion systems. Building the partnerships with those developers, uh, the commercial developers that want to do engine work or, or booster work, and using capability that we've used over the years in Apollo and the shuttle program, uh, the analytic capability, the, uh, the institutional infrastructure that we have, component test facilities, uh, test stands at different places, be able to use that now to help commercial as they begin to develop uh, their own versions uh, of engines, but use the capability that, that we have and the experience that we've garnered over the years and be able to make that transformation with those commercial entities. Great, thank you. And Steve, how about at Langley? All right, I'll try this one. Um, let's see. So, I mean, a few things. Okay, great. Okay, so a few things. First, um, you know, we definitely have some commitments in the next five years or so that we're really focused on and delivering on those commitments, both in the aeronautics research side, on exploration, and in, in science, too. So, for example, we're, uh, you know, really doing a lot of great analysis and ground tests for environmentally responsible aviation to meet the goals of reducing fuel burn, reducing drag, reducing uh, noise, and reducing emissions. And we're, uh, gonna look, we're looking at several configurations now and hope to down-select to a, uh, you know, a, a configuration in the next year or so and really ring that out for the next generation you know, transport aircraft. Also, we're working really closely with AIMS on advanced concepts for more of a distributed air traffic management system to try to uh, get a more scalable ATM system by looking at uh, awareness and tools for the pilots in the cockpit, as well as ground controllers. And we'll be doing a joint experiment with Ames in the next several years on that, and hopefully we'll transfer that technology, you know, eventually to the FAA. Um, so in the exploration side, we lead the launch abort system, and uh, we continue to uh, refine that design 
and have a, te you know, a test flight coming up, hopefully, um, to do a scent abort. Um, and that's a really critical test flight for that system. So we're always focused on delivering our commitments. The second thing is we've been on a journey um, over the last three or four years at Langley in kind of reinv reinvigorating innovation within the center. Um, so we, did, we were doing a lot of good research and a lot of good technology development, a lot of good invention, but that's not necessarily innovation, where you're applying that research and technology to solving problems and developing new capabilities. So we were looking at that, that's kind of the goal of the new space technology program, is not to develop, do research and just develop widgets, but to develop systems um, for capabilities that we need in the future. And so that's been critical for us. We're getting a little insular at the center and not looking at what was going on, not only within the country, but worldwide. Um, you know, more than the majority of the research done in this country now is outside of government. And over half the research in the world is done, a, a large majority of the research in the world is done outside of this country. So we're trying to open it up and look at how we can combine other research and technologies with our research technology to develop innovative new systems and also innovate at the systems level. Um, new configurations that, uh, even old configurations that could not be realized in the past, but can be realized now with the application of new technologies. That's the second thing. And the third thing is we're trying to look out a little bit farther and uh, really look at what, you know, might be the new breakthroughs that could uh, give us new capabilities in the future. So we develop things that are sort of like grand challenges at the center. They're called revolutionary technical challenges. And uh, they, they're what doing with those is try to put big goals out there, like, for example, significantly reduce the uh, cost of a, a pound of payload to lower Earth orbit, and really look at what configurations, what technologies can enable that in the 10, 15, 20-year time frame so that we'll, we'll be prepared as we move forward to, uh, to, to advance, uh, in that example, spaceflight. Excellent. Thanks. And Pete at Ames. Well, uh, Ames is uh, sometimes referred to as the uncenter. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so probably our first objective is just to survive. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, uh, if there's a weird idea that comes into the agency, more often than not it comes from Ames or maybe a troublesome idea. So uh, Rebe Rebecca's nodding. She knows a few recently. Uh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we're, we're in Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is in us. And uh, uh, our top objective is to continue what we've done for the last 70 years and, uh, and bring uh, uh, new ideas. A lot of them will be stupid. Some of them will piss people off. Uh, and, and to bring them to the agency, because we think we add that sort of unique uh, aspect. Uh, and, and let me, you know, since you wanted three things, uh, uh, let me just put what, where I think the, the, the three kind of technical problems that we think we can contribute to. Uh, and, and I'm going to sort of talk about three things that NASA does. Uh, and I'm going to pick science first because I'm a scientist. Uh, you know, in the last couple decades, uh, NASA revolutionized our understanding of physics. Uh, each new discovery we made showed we knew less about the universe than we thought. That we, we, we figured out that actually the matter we're made of is ghost matter. It's a few percent, and the rest of it we don't know anything about. Uh, now, that's job security for physicists, so I'm delighted. Uh, but it, 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 was, it was really a great honor that one of our colleagues at Goddard, a, a civil servant, won the Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of an organization where one of your members can win the, the top prize. Uh, in the next couple decades, I'm convinced the challenges will be in biology. And so the first objective is, to, is how can NASA help? And I think that we are going to be key to that and uh, particularly interested in what, uh, in what we can offer. But uh, I think we'll begin to understand how life began, where else is it in the universe, and then from those, what is its future? So the first objective is science. Uh, second is that the taxpayers pay us to do a couple things, but one of the things they're really interested in is uh, helping life here on Earth. And, I, and I, there's a couple things that we're playing a big role in, as our folks from other centers. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, one of those, uh, the first A's in, in, in uh, NASA, Advanced for Aeronautics. Uh, we have a challenge ahead of us. You know, today uh, we as, as, as Americans, most of us here, uh, we enjoy air travel. You know, we hop on flights, go across the country, across the world. Uh, most of the rest of the world doesn't do that, but they want to do that, and it's important that they do do that. 
Today, airplanes produce a few percent of the greenhouse emission. Uh, if the whole world travels as much as we do, that'll be 30 percent uh, in 10 or 20 years. So a challenge is for us to help industry, American industry, develop the means to do carbon neutral and eventually carbon free uh, aviation. And that's one of the great challenges that, that particularly the aeronautics oriented centers are going to be helping industry. So uh, that's an one. Another part of that is climate change. Now I know there's some argue about climate change. If you don't think there's any climate change, I think you're nuts. But uh, you know that's uh, you know that's my personal scientific opinion, uh, <laughs> not necessarily the agencies. But uh, uh, the uh, we are at the point where in the next few decades we'll be able to not just understand this broad global perspective, but very specific site-specific climate prediction to understand that you know and and, and I. Uh, I hesitate to use this example because I got accused by Senator Coburn of only doing wine-related work here at Ames. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it turns out that uh, a few years ago, the Lieutenant Governor of California had a little wine, uh, or had a, had a uh, uh, meeting about climate change, and they had a representative of the wine industry in California. And I wasn't paying much attention until he got up. And uh, uh, it turns out wine is the fifth largest industry in the state. Uh, in fact, if you'd like, you can sample some. We'll sell it to you. Uh, that, uh, but it's a big deal about what the climate's going to be like 20 or 30 years. It takes 20 or 30 years for a vineyard to mature. And so they need to know site-specific, you know, is do I need to move the Chardonnay up the hill? Do I need to move to a valley 50 kilometers north? Uh, and those kind of things go across the board. If the city of San Francisco wants to build a, a new port, you know, maybe you should put it uh, uphill about 50 feet. Uh, you know, those are the kind of things that are really critical. Now the third one is the one where all the controversy is. And, and uh, uh, this center, like all of them, I think it's, it's, it's perhaps the most interesting one as we've discussed. We are on the verge of permanent expansion into the solar system as a species. Uh, and we need to develop the technologies that enable us to do that affordable. We, we need to help industry develop the systems. We need to look beyond, and that's a huge challenge. And uh, uh, just to give you one example of things that we're doing here, uh, we are looking at uh, synthetic biology, the ability to actually engineer biology to enable us to live on other worlds. So this is across the board the kind of things that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to, to close, uh, I'll indicate that as the discussion here is these things all require innovative new partnerships. They are partnerships with the private sector. They are partnerships uh, uh, with other government agencies. At this center, we do almost a, a, a quarter of our work is work for other government agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, that helps keep the wolf from the door. Uh, but it's very important. I mean, we're part of, we're part of the, 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 the government as a whole. And finally, international partnerships. Uh, we've sort of pioneered efforts here to work with non-traditional partners. Uh, uh, some of the work that started here, we've now signed agreements with Israel, Saudi Arabia, South Korea. And there's more in the works. So. Uh, these are uh, these are are things that we really need to do. So the you know, you know I haven't given you a, a specific three things. Probably about three by three. So, <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you, Pete. You you touched on um, the next question that I was going to ask, which is the biggest challenges that are facing each of your centers. And um, so, Gina, I was wondering if you could touch a little on that. One of the biggest challenges that we have is actually getting to the point of implementing this. Several of the speakers have talked today about how to government and commercial work together. Uh, as we begin to form partnerships with commercial entities, how do we assure ourselves and, and commercial that we're not giving one a competitive advantage versus another? Uh, the mechanics of actually implementing something, we've talked about SpaceX versus FAR-based contracting today. How do we make those commitments uh, with the, those partners and do work for them? We have an example currently of a task that we've been asked to do, yet we are needing to do the competitive analysis to see are we competing with industry in doing that work for that commercial partner, specifically on something that they had asked us as a center to do. All of these are things that we can work out, but working through that during this period is, is one of the toughest challenges that we have. How do we mechanically make these things work? Mm -hmm. Bob. 
I think the number one challenge uh, right now is the the budget issues that we have, trying to live within these tight budgets with 40-year-old uh, uh, infrastructure. And I think it's even more important why this uh, commercial government partnership is important, how we can uh, effectively utilize the facilities that we have uh, so that it's advantageous for everyone. You know, you get into what does enable commercial space mean? And, you know, I mean, if we really want to enable commercial space, it's going to require an effort on our part to ensure that, you know, we can work with the commercial companies to utilize the assets that we have to both our advantages. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, you can just charge anything you want to use them. It's got to be cost effective because no company is going to do something that, you know, they can't do well uh, at a fair price. So uh, we have a lot of excess capacity and we're working on uh, partnerships with the state of Florida and commercial companies to enable commercial operations out of the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, so financial challenges and then the bureaucracy, if you will, but you know, there's a lot of regulations that you have to deal with when you deal with the government on how you utilize those facilities and what you pay and what you can't pay and what you can do and what you can't do, and trying to make it so that it is not overly restrictive, that it is cost effective, that it can meet uh, the commercial partner's needs to do what he wants uh, so that we can accomplish our goal of enabling commercial space and not make it so hard that you can't. And to try and work through all that, uh, it's a huge challenge. And then uh, I'd say uh, ensuring that we have the right skills in the workforce uh, that are able to support uh, where we're going in the future. And some of that's a, a balance in the skill mix, and some of it, it has to do with just the uh, number of jobs and people. But I think that we have an awful lot that is available right now, and uh, we have an opportunity. You know, now's the time. We've got to make this work. We don't have a choice, okay? And we have a lot of resources that are available, and it'd be a shame to see them just sit and uh, deteriorate and be wasted because we couldn't figure out how to do it cost effectively and make it work for everybody. Thank you. Steve. Okay, so, um, yeah, so similar, so, so, some similar things to what Bob discussed. Um, so we have a 94-year-old center, um, and th that brings lots of challenges. So, you know, Langley, uh, the Langley that uh, Charles talked about is Langley Research Center. We were established in 1917 as the first field center of, of NACA, and uh, we are affectionately known as the Mother Center. Uh, some words uh, go, go after that sometimes. I'll keep this G-rated. Um, <laughs> so, um, and the folks from Langley left and took, went to Cleveland and formed the Lewis Research Center and left and came to California and formed the Ames Research Center. And then even in the early 60s, the Mercury 7 were at Langley and folks left Langley, Kraft, and Gilworth and Company and went and formed the Johnson Space, well, the Man Space Center in, in uh, Houston and now the Johnson Space Center. So we do have, uh, we've been around for a while and have a, a lot of, um, aging infrastructure. We've actually closed down a lot, uh, many large-scale test facilities and wind tunnels, and there are lots of good reasons for that. You know, one is um, we, Ames, Langley, and others have advanced computational tools and physics-based modeling tremendously over the last decades. Um, and what we used to do in tunnels and with tests, we do on computers now, particularly configuration screening and exploring novel ideas early on. We used to do a lot of, a lot of testing. Now we all do it on the desktop. Um, we're also building a lot fewer aircraft, both in the DOD side and in industry than we used to. Um, so our challenge moving forward is, given the budget challenges, what is strategically the right capabilities um, for the agency and the nation moving forward? And it's going to be really tough. There'll be pressure, uh, big time pressure, um, to reduce, um, reduce infrastructure and reduce capabilities. And we just need to make sure we have the right capabilities moving forward and new capabilities moving forward to meet NASA's mission and for the country. So that's, gonna, that's a huge challenge, particularly, like Bob said, in this current budget environment. And the second thing, and this is not just a Langley unique thing, as we move forward with uh, pro, pro, flight programs and technology development activities, what's the right balance of um, cost, schedule, and risk? Um, you know, we can, in many times, and, and that will meet the right technical requirements. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we will um, spend a lot of time and a lot of money driving the last few percent of risk out of, a, out of a system or try to take a very conservative risk posture on a technology development activity. Um, so given the, the level of risk and activity, the level of visibility, what you're trying to accomplish, 
what is the right balance, uh, with the right technical requirements, what's the right balance of cost, schedule, and an acceptable risk posture that will achieve your goals, uh, you know, most effectively and efficiently. And so that's going to be uh, that's going to be especially important given the budget challenges we're going to have, in that we we obviously be asking right now to do way more program than we have budget for. Thank you, Pete. Well, I think th to echo uh, uh, my colleagues, there's. Uh, Again, I, I sort of see three key areas. Uh, the first one is facilities that have been discussed. Uh, they are aging. As I said, we're only 71 years old. Uh, we were founded before Glenn and Lewis, so w one year. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but uh, we're number two, so we try harder. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, most of these facilities, uh, the aeronautics facilities, were mostly built in the in the 40s and 50s, in the in the space facilities in the 60s. Uh, the thing that if we're going to be an NACA for the, the new industries, we have to, one of the best things we can do is provide facilities that are too expensive or complicated for an individual company to do. And so it is really important that we, that we as NASA figure out what facilities do you need that, uh, that are common to across the industry and how do, we, uh, how do we build those, how do we maintain them. In some cases it's, it's upgrading an existing facility. In other cases, it's going to be a build, a, a build a new one. So that's very important to work in partnership with you. The second is, uh, you know, I mentioned aging facilities, uh, uh, aging people. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm supposed not to be ageist. Uh, being 61, I'm sort of close to get away with it. Uh, but uh, uh, the average age of employees in at NASA, civil service employees, uh, is around 50. In fact, here at this center, it's like 52. Now, not that old people aren't good. Uh, you know, in fact, I had a sign in my office for a long time that said, old age and treachery beats youth and confidence any day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, it's important to have a mix. It's important to replace ourselves. This is a challenge, particularly in the civil service, because what we find, and we're, we're facing this now, is that, that in downturn areas where we're, there's less resources, then people say, well, you know, we, we'd really like to downsize the civil service force. So, uh, if we don't get rifts, we get hiring freezes. I know right now, I think the, the both Marshall and, and uh, uh, Kennedy have, uh, I think Johnson as well, have a two for one. So if two people leave, you can hire one new one. It's very hard to change that aging uh, human capital. And I, I think it's important, that's a challenge of how we do that. And, and we're facing that as an agency uh, to bring new people in. And that doesn't, doesn't just mean younger people. It means people that are new to the field. Uh, so that's a very important area. The third one is resources, and uh, you know you you know you, you you can't open a newspaper or turn on the your internet without seeing that you know the challenge about resources. We're going to have less money, and the biggest challenge is uh, is doing these magnificent things that we have on our plate, and and helping to form new industry with less money. And it means we have to be creative. We're going to have to find new ways of doing things. Uh, so, and those are big challenges. So, I, I think the three things that face all of us are, 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 are huge. And we, we, we all sat in on this budget meeting here a couple days ago, and it was a shock. You know, I had to use several bottles of the California agricultural product to kind of get over the shock. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I think, I think it's pretty common across our, our centers. Thank you. Um, something that I'm noti noting throughout your answers is how much each of you talks about NASA and NASA as a whole and not just your individual centers. And to me, that's an extremely important aspect um, of why you all are center directors and why you know NASA really does work. Um, I'd like to ask you a question that comes from our audience. Uh, and this is related to the challenges. Uh, everybody mentioned the challenge of the budget. And the question is, among the plans related to the national debt debate, one included the elimination of an entire NASA center. Are the nine healthy centers an outmoded concept? Does anybody want to take that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> Lori, you want to come up? <laughs> so, so let me just say one thing about that. Um, so as a bumper sticker, yes, OK? <laughs> um, so I think it's, we're, we're done with the bumper sticker, right, Nine Healthy Centers. However, 
what came out of that was a much stronger collaboration amongst the centers. Yeah. And I think we all agree we did not, we do not want to lose that as part of moving forward. And, and, and a, so that collaboration was healthy because we were collaborating focused on mission success. We were collaborating, we were collaborating not to see, get the biggest piece of the pie for ourselves, um, but we were collaborating focused on, on mission success. So, for example, um, you know, we made many trips to uh, Houston and Huntsville to talk to the Orion and PCV and launch vehicle folks about the things that a Langley can do for them that we used to, that we frankly did for every vehicle development, shuttle and before, which is aerodynamic characterization, aerothermodynamics, light dynamics and control, advanced structures work. And uh, our, I'm really proud of the center because our guys who are doing research um, heave to and use those the research and tools Analysis, analysis tools and test techniques that they developed in, by error primarily in, in the research world and applied them to um, the new spacecraft and the new rocket um, in collaboration with many other centers, not just those two, but all, all the, you know, the test flight was with KSC and we, uh, Orion error characterization is with JSC and, and Ames. So I think that's the, that's the piece of that that we definitely want to continue. Thank you, anyone else? Yeah, let me, uh, uh, this is uh, just sort of a comment on, you know, the, the Defense Department went through BRAC. Uh, I haven't he seen very many analysis that show that it saved really much of any money. And it says, because uh, what matters is what you do. And one of the, the, the dangers of, of looking at closing one or more centers, and we've been through this before, is that that people that, are, that look at top level budgets and Congress or OMB, often, you know, say, well, you know, Ames cost 800 million a year, so we, we'll close that down and we'll save the 800 million. Uh, what happens is that, you know, at least people initially say, well, they'll just distribute that money to the other places and we'll make them stronger. In fact, what happens? You close down a center, uh, that money disappears, and so, you you know, if, if you say, well, I, I can't really maintain nine or ten healthy centers, uh, we'll we'll close down a couple of them but you don't redistribute that funds. And so what you end up with, you say, well, I have 10 unhealthy centers, so I'll close two or three, and now I'll have seven unhealthy ones. Uh, that isn't the answer. So, so these simplistic ideas that we'll just shut some things down is really the wrong way to do it. I think we need to look at what we do as an agency, how we work with the private sector, and see how we can do these things more efficiently and how we can work together, and I think that's happening. Thanks. Um, another question is, dealing with partnerships and partnerships with the commercial space industry. Um, for each of you, what opportunities exist now at your center for partnering with the commercial space industry? Let's see, let's start with Jean. We already have some partnerships uh, with engine developers. Uh, we're working very closely with Orbital Sciences Corporation right now on one of the COTS programs. Uh, they're not only are they doing work at Marshall Space Flight Center, it's mostly analytic and development work. They're doing testing of engines at Stennis Space Center. So that's one of the really good examples uh, of a partnership that is in effect, where they are taking an engine and their investment that they want to enhance and further develop that engine for a better capability. And they're wanting to use capabilities that we've developed in supporting the shuttle program and other programs over the years. So I think that's one of the key examples of, of where such a partnership can be effective. And can you talk, Jean, about uh, partnerships you see in the future in the next five to ten years you see growing? I expect that we will see more of those. As we work through this transformation, as Bob called it, where we learn how we can make these partnerships work, where we learn where we're not uh, competing with industry or where we're not giving one, one uh, commercial entity a, a an advantage over another one as we begin to find what are the capabilities that we have that it's most efficient to come to the government to obtain, be it facilities or be it, be it uh, technical analytical capability. I, th I think we will see more of these types of partnerships evolve, especially as programs get defined as we begin to firm up what our plans are and what the mix of commercial and government is. I, I believe a lot will evolve from that. So I would see it as being more of those types of partnerships. 
Great, thanks. Bob, partnerships now and over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, and, and the partnerships are not just uh, between uh, the government, NASA, and commercial companies, but I mean, it's between uh, NASA and states mm -hmm. as well as commercials, and that's one of the models we're using at KSC. Uh, we have Exploration Park, which is an industrial uh, research park located uh, at KSC, but outside the fence, anchored by the Space Life Sciences Lab, uh, with the new center for uh, utilizing the uh, science on the space station as we work through the agreements there and bring that into place. That'll be an anchor tenant. We hope to have more university involvement. Uh, there's also uh, room for uh, in commercial companies to come in and actually you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be specifically space related, but technologies that apply to uh, the work that we're doing in space. And that is all being funded through a, a Space Act agreement with uh, the state of Florida. Uh, at the Kennedy Space Center itself, we have numerous Space Act agreements uh, utilizing a lot of the patents that we have with different companies uh, for the technologies we've developed, uh, as well as some of the more, uh, the larger ones, again, actually with the uh, commercial companies that are. Uh, working on, um, you know, commercial crew development. Uh, again, working with the state of Florida, we hope to utilize some excess capacity in our facilities to bring uh, future commercial work where it's actually being done there at the Cape supporting uh, commercial crew. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for partnering together to utilize the resources that we have, and we just got to make sure that we make it successful. And uh, we're all in this together. It's not a uh, us and them. I mean, it's it's we're together as NASA centers, but I, I believe it it truly is a, a NASA commercial partnership in order to make this work. Thank you, Steve. Partnerships now and in the future. Yeah. So we're we're involved in, with um, with industry now in the same way that we were kind of involved with the space flight centers and development of say Orion and PCV, um, using our you know technical expertise in helping them be successful. Um, you know, I, I think there is a fear when, you know, Bob mentioned we're all in this together. I think there is a fear that if the uh, commercial guys, particularly the new space commercial guys, engage the NASA centers and the government, we'll get in there and we'll try to torque the requirements around, make them add, you know, add testing or add, you know, additional reliability and drive cost up. I think that's a fear. And, and I, don't, I do not believe that's what, that, you know, how we, any of the centers are approaching working with commercial. We're really there to provide the technical capabilities that we have to make commercial successful because it's really important to the agency that commercial be successful. And so, um, and so we, uh, you know, we've, we've done um, a lot, uh, we've tried a lot of technical analysis and testing capability for multiple, um, multiple partners uh, obviously, you'll, you'll hear later probably from Mark Sarangelo that we have the strongest partnership with uh, Sierra Nevada in that they're using uh, a Langley concept, the HL-20, as their vehicle. And so they've leveraged what we've done in the past on HL-20, what we've done in the future. And actually, HL-20 is actually originally a Russian concept. Um, a gentleman from a three-letter agency came to Langley many years ago and said, took these pictures of this Russian vehicle in the water, what the heck is it? And it was the bore, and it turned out to be a really cool design in that it's uh, laterally and longitudinally aerodynamically stable from Mach 0.3 to Mach 20. Um, so we reverse engineered it and refined it, and now hopefully it's going to fly as the Dream Chaser. So um, it, it's pretty amazing. But that's how it happened. Uh, Del Freeman was the guy that the CIA came to and said, what the heck is this thing at Langley in the vehicle analysis branch? It's kind of wild. Um, so in the future, um, you know, I think um, Hopefully, we're going to develop with space technology and other means um, new, new concepts and technologies in the future that will help even enable commercial space to make uh, more rapid advances and bring uh, new capabilities online even faster. And I'm going to tag on to something Steve said. You know, there's this big fear. If we come work with the government, you're going to put all these restrictions on us. We've got to do things your way, and uh, you're going to make it impossible for us to, uh, to succeed. Uh, I've got my director of uh, safety and mission assurance at KSC. We're going through all our safety requirements, and we're taking a look at what is really a requirement and what is really a, a best practice, and ensuring that we only have those requirements that are, in fact, requirements. And uh, where possible, you know, if you meet OSHA standards, that's good. Uh, for example, the ONC High Bay, where uh, uh, the MPCV is going to be processed, that's a, a commercial zone where, you know, we don't. Uh, 
they are responsible for the safety within there, meeting their standards. So there are ways to work things, but I, I want you to know that we also are taking a look at, you know, we don't want to have onerous restrictions that make it impossible to do work with us, but we also want to make sure that we have the right uh, safety requirements uh, met. So that's another thing that we're going through. Thanks. Pete. Yeah, I think the uh, partnerships is what NASA has to be all about in the future, and we already are. Uh, let me start with, you know, the commercial partnerships, which we've discussed a lot. And I think it's important to look, there's kind of three components of commercial partnerships. The first one are space companies, the things that people that are building space stuff. And uh, both traditional and new companies, uh, this has been very successful, as, as some of my colleagues have talked about, the, uh, the, the new commercial companies that we're going to rely on are relying on us. Uh, an example here, we transitioned uh, PICA, which is the heat shield material to, that they used on the Dragon capsule, uh, transition that to SpaceX. Uh, so those are the kind of things that as we develop technology, we can transition it. Uh, but there are two other commercial uh, partners that, that may even be more important. The second one is non-traditional partners. There's a kind of a little startup over here, I think it's called Giggle or Google or something, uh, right <laughs> next door, that, that uh, we've, uh, uh, we have as a non-traditional partner. And uh, they're very interested, you know, they're, they're in the business of organizing the world's data. Uh, and that includes space data. So we have worked with them to, to help give them data for, for Google Earth. They've put together a Google Moon and a Google Mars, and uh, we're trying to get them to do a Google Sun. Uh, that, uh, that, that really are, it helps them, it helps them uh, in their business. Uh, we're doing the same thing with Cisco and Microsoft, and they're actually sending us money to do some of this. So non-traditional partners are extremely important, and we're going to do more and more of that. The third set of partners, though, I think we, uh, we talked a little bit about it at KSC, is uh, startups. You know, we are in the business of helping America develop new industries and new ideas. Uh, you're sitting in the, in the NASA Research Park here, which uh, was the first research park in NASA, and uh, there's uh, about 80 companies here and universities, and uh, uh, these have been, some of them, spectacularly successful. If you drive out the gate, you'll see our new building right on the right. Right near the road, you'll see some kind of gold-colored boxes. Those are what we're calling bloom boxes. Uh, it turns out in the, in the 1990s, we had a scientist here who was developing a fuel cell for a Mars airplane, which got canceled. And so he said, uh, well, this has a lot of potential on Earth. Formed a company, uh, now called Bloom Energy. Uh, these are fuel cells that can supply modular power to any d different facility, eventually even to your house. You can work off any hydrocarbon. Uh, we can provide 200 kilowatts of non-interruptible permanent power from those, those cells. And so we worked with them. This is their first next generation system. So Helping startups, uh, another one just, we, we have what's called the Singularity University here, which is looking at exponentially growing technologies. Uh, just last year, uh, a group of young people from that organization decided that they could do 3D printing in space. So instead of stressing a satellite for launch, we could print it in space. And uh, they're called Made in Space. They did a startup. They got uh, a little bit of money from various investors, and they just tested a week ago on the zero-G airplane. Uh, that they could do 3D printing. Uh, so these are revolutionary new capabilities, and we really ought to uh, think about trying to help do the new things. The, the second partnership has been mentioned, and this is with governments, and, uh, or with the U.S. government. Uh, we do probably $150 million of work here as an executing agent for the Department of Defense. And uh, DOD, as a lot of you know, is sort of downsized. They did a lot of bracking on their laboratories. Bad idea. And, and they they find that they don't have a lot of the in-house competence to execute high-tech programs. So they're coming to us. Almost all the DOD small satellite programs we are executing out of here, we're managing for them, uh, executing their new airship programs. So a lot of effort with other government agencies. Uh, a couple of folks mentioned states. It, that's extremely important. Uh, this center, we've signed agreements with two states, uh, Hawaii and Alaska, and we're working with them. Although I kind of got it goofed up. I visited Alaska in January and Hawaii in August. I didn't get that one right. Uh, but uh, uh, Alaska is an interesting state. Uh, a third of the people don't live on any roads. They live, the only way to get to them is by air. Uh, the aeronautics capabilities we are doing in the next generation air traffic control is ready made for the state of Alaska. And so we're having major conferences and work with them. A 
And by the way, Alaska is neat because it's one of the few states that isn't broke. Uh, so that's been really helpful. And, and I also recently mentioned international cooperation. This is one of the ways we're going to make things affordable. Uh, this center in Dryden, uh, our sister center to the south, uh, are working with the Germans on the, uh, uh, the SOFIA, which is a 747, which has just started scientific operations with a Hubble-class telescope, uh, taking Hubble-quality uh, uh, data. Uh, the Germans paid about a third of this program. They're supporting it. More and more of those programs are going to be possible across, uh, across, the, uh, across the world. Excellent. Thank you. And another question from our audience. As NASA leaders, what roles do you have in selling commercial space flight to the public and especially to our political leaders? Well, I just was up on the Hill uh, a few weeks ago talking to uh, congressional leaders and uh, stressing the importance of, I mean, it, it goes without saying. Uh, we have to get our crews to the International Space Station. We are not building a NASA rocket to do that, all right? We have to have a commercial rocket to do that if we, unless we want to depend on the Russians forever. And I don't think that's any, none of us want that, all right? So uh, I think they clearly see uh, the need to make this work, hopefully. I mean, it, it, it's important. Uh, as far as selling it, how do you sell it to anybody? Uh, this is, you know, if you really look at it, uh, this partnership that we have on uh, commercial crew development, we are going to get to some form of a, a contract in the end. Yeah, you can call it whatever you want, but you know we are going to pay for a commercial service. We are going to buy it from a commercial company, just as we buy everything from commercial companies. And it, it's a little different model than we've used in the past, but uh, it's no different. Well, it is different, but it's you know, I mean, we're still purchasing something from a commercial company and uh, using it to get our crews to the space station. So, y you know, there isn't anything really to sell here. We need to make it work. We just mm -hmm. got to press ahead and get it done. Anyone else thoughts on that? Yeah, just a quick thought. I mean, we definitely need to not we de not portray this or not let people portray this as an either or proposition, right? We want to do commercial. We want to stimulate commercial. We need it. And we want to develop the systems to explore beyond the solar system, beyond low Earth orbit, and send people out into the into the solar system. Um, so you know, we got to try to avoid ourselves and others to cast this as an either or proposition, and that's that's uh, that's one way of moving things forward. Absolutely, and that's uh, the message that I was giving. We, it's not exclusive. We can we can do both. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so what can the commercial space industry do better to help NASA? Uh, are there things that they can be doing or that could be improved to better provide better assistance to NASA? Let's start with, uh, mix it up a little bit. Pete. Lower prices. <laughs> I, I, I'm really quite serious about that. I, I think that, that uh, uh, we have got to figure out how to do the things we do in, in, in NASA, the science and space and aeronautics, less money. So find us a solution that costs less and gives us similar or greater reliability. And uh, that's the challenge. I mean, if, if, uh, you know, if, if you come to us and say, oh, I can do this wonderful thing, but it costs a gazillion dollars, uh, you know, that doesn't help us much. If you come and say, hey, I've got a, a, a way to do a space mission for half the cost of what you've been doing and prove it, uh, that's what we need. Steve. Yeah, so I think, you know, the thing that uh, it goes without saying, but, you know, we really need to work in partnership. And that means we need your, um, obviously, new innovative ideas. And we need to you to work with us to figure out how th those ideas could best be applied, as well as uh, using leverage our technical expertise and making them a reality. Um, so, um, again, I've seen, um, I, actually, I've seen partnerships work uh, really well in traditional contracting approaches, um, where we've, it was a cost plus contract in traditional, but we work together uh, more as partners, uh, without, getting cro get, without getting the contracting crosswise with the contracting officer, um, to leverage the capabilities on both sides, the government side and the, and, and the industry side, to make the e endeavor successful. Um, so, um, you know, I think absolutely, like we talked before, like on CC Dev, uh, moving forward, we need to listen to you all, to the industry, and, and structure things in the right way, and then you, you all can 
we can have this uh, feedback loop and hopefully develop this virtual cycle where we can move things forward together much more effectively than we could uh, with, with the, uh, working alone. Thanks. Gene, what can the commercial space flight industry maybe improve or do better? I think building on what Steve just said, have, helping us have the dialogue. We hear a lot about how we stand in the way and how we're an impediment to commercial being able to do their work. Uh, we, we all know we have issues. We know we're in a difficult time of trying to make that transition. Having those tough discussions, uh, someone said earlier today, uh, Lori did, continuing to hold government's feet to the fire in how we go about doing this. Having that dialogue, I think, helps us all understand how is it that we can help commercial better and that we can say what do we need in order to be able to affect these relationships. Thanks. Bob? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's pretty well covered. It's it continue to work in a true partnership, share information with us. When we ask for information, make sure we get it so that we're doing what you need. Uh, we went through this at KSC when we went on asking for you know, how can we do things better to work with business? What, what are the impediments to, uh, to making it work? And we're trying to work on some of those things to make it better. Um, I think we all realize, you know, this commercial model we got for commercial crew, without the space station as an anchor tenant to make, uh, to make it viable, you know, we really need a destination to get people to. But I think we've got to work on, all right, besides just flying U.S. astronauts up there, do we have a model? Can we generate enough business elsewhere? And, and keep generating the business, keep the interest going, and let's uh, figure out how to do this in a cost-effective way that we really can expand upon who we, are, who we are flying up to space and why. Thank you. Another question from our audience. Uh, how can NASA best engage industry partners from regions without a NASA center? Can these be win-win, even though they aren't serving the local political needs of a center in an associated region? Anybody with that, uh, thoughts on that? I think we do that today. I mean, the, uh, the, the industries that we're working with are from all over the country. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, you know, frankly, uh, the, the consideration of where they're from in the United States is, is not an issue. And uh, if it's a good idea and uh, we can help them, we do. And uh, I think that's true of all the centers. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so, um, so there are formal means right, to get engaged, anybody can get engaged. Um, NASA research announcements and announcements of opportunity. So uh, as well as um, <laughs> the IPP programs, SBIR, STTR. Um, so there's uh, multiple opportunities to formally engage um, NASA and get your ideas and get, uh, get, get in a partnership and get funded. There are also tons of informal ways to do it. Um, you know, uh, our, uh, our researchers and engineers are constantly out at conferences and networking with the, you know, with the, the community. Um, and uh, we get unsolicited proposals um, and from all over the country. So I think Pete's right. We, there are multiple formal and informal mechanisms to engage um, uh, folks that are interested in, in innovating and working with NASA across the country. International partnerships, it, you know, it gets a little, it gets a little complex, particularly on the aero side. We, we have had Airbus North America come to us and want to get in partnership on things like drag reduction technologies for vehicles. And, you know, that's probably not appropriate from a U.S. Uh, economic competitive standpoint in that it could give them a, a leg up on our uh, domestic uh, commercial aircraft provider. But there are probably things that we could collaborate with them on, like aviation safety technologies because that's kind of an all boats rise kind of deal where we want, where you're flying on an Airbus vehicle or a Boeing vehicle, you want to be safe, right? Also, what we mentioned before, air traffic management technologies. You know, our planes need to work in the U.S. ATM system and they got to work in Europe and in Asia. And so there are some areas where I think it's, you know, we don't get crossways with economic competitive issues that where we, even in era where we can collaborate internationally as an example. But, you know, it gets, it, it does get, uh, when you throw, it was mentioned before, lots of times when the uh, industry panel is up here, ITAR, you know, you throw that issue in there and it gets very complex to collaborate in, internationally. Hopefully we'll have reform there and uh, get to a better place there. But, um, but yeah, even international is important too. Thanks. Uh, another question from our audience. Getting the public, sorry, getting the public excited about space exploration has been discussed a number of times today. What are each of your centers doing towards this goal? 
there we continue to do the, the outreach programs that we have been doing. Uh, many of our engineers, many of our employees continue to do outreach efforts with schools, talking to schools. I think that's something incumbent on all of us is to reach out to those people uh, in any way or, or form that we can, providing material, creating websites. One of the most frustrating things to me is to be part of an industry that everyone's excited about. One of the speakers earlier today said everyone loves NASA, but they're not sure why. One of the, the frequent comments I get is that we don't do enough to get our message out, uh, yet I lived across from a neighbor who was a school board member for years that I would provide information to on how she could get this to her school teachers uh, and, and to students, and yet she never did anything with it. Every time we had dinner, the question was, where can I get information? So. I don't want to lay the, the responsibility on the public. It certainly doesn't exist there, but part of it does. We're, we're constrained in what we can do as a government agency on advertising and, and putting the message out there. I think the best thing we can do right now is just be the best model that we can be, take those opportunities to try to convey that through the press, through education, through visits, et cetera. And that's a limited way of doing it, but right now that's the means that we have, and we just need to make best use of that. And, and uh, you know, now with the shuttle uh, retired, we don't get folks down to the KSC to see shuttle launches anymore, but I'm telling you, any rocket launch is an exciting thing to see. And uh, we have a guest services uh, program for our uh, launch services program, launches from both the West Coast and the East Coast, and we're trying to get more folks involved with uh, our science missions and the importance of it and, uh, and seeing a rocket take off, and I think that's important. I think uh, commercial industry, you know, we're trying to expand KSC and utilize that shuttle landing facility. We're looking at both uh, horizontal and vertically launched uh, vehicles. But uh, I think, w you know, if we can really get uh, the suborbital flights going, get people flying in space and let them see that, uh, you know, share that excitement, uh, that's going to help. I, this really is a lot like aviation was back, you know, in the barnstorming age of aviation. And if we can capitalize on that, get more folks in this interested, being a part of it, being involved, uh, and then bring the cost down and, you know, get the right partnerships and technology going our way, you know, this really can take off. And, and Steve, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, just to add, <laughs> so, um, I'll say this with some trouble, I mean, we definitely got get, have to get better at storytelling. That's telling the story of what we're doing, where we're going, and why we're doing it. Um, we do not do, we, you know, we're a bunch of geeks, we're a bunch of scientists and engineers, so we go from the, the goal of what we're trying to do down into the technical details in about five seconds, right, and everybody just kind of woo, you know. Um, I've been in plenty of talks where I've seen people glaze over, and you know, you have permanently lost them in your talk, never to get them back, right? So um, we got to get much better at telling the story of what we're doing and why we're doing it, and then, like, like uh, Gina Bob said, demonstrable progress towards fulfilling that story, the dream of that story, at which includes uh, celebrating all, all the, you know, celebrating and publicizing all the launches, all the testing and test flights we do along the way, all the commercial successes along the way, um, to, to get people, uh, you know, to demonstrate to people that we are absolutely, you know, using your money to make progress to, to you know, explore beyond Earth and, and into the solar system. Thank you. Another question uh, for everyone on the panel. What do you see as the biggest barriers or challenges to partnering with the commercial space industry? We, we touched on this a little bit, but can you outline a little bit more about the, the challenges or barriers, Pete? Uh, three words, bureaucrats, bureaucrats, bureaucrats. Uh, you know, I, I've got to say that, that one of the biggest challenges I see as there becomes more discussion and less resources and more controversy about our programs, the, the ability to, to do creative new things is, is becoming harder and harder. And, and it's because of, you know, somebody is, is, wants to second guess you. Uh, this center has been in trouble, you know, in the last six months, probably a half dozen times of trying to do something new. And it's, it's a challenge to us. And I think as a government agency, we need to work hard on that. Now, part of it is that that we need to, to kind of tell Congress that, look, you know, yes, you have a legitimate constitutional role, but to second guess every $2.98 thing we've done and complain about it 
uh, is going to stifle the initiative that we need to do to solve our problems. So when a, you know, a, a, in fact, I, one of the things that said is no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, I'm reminded of the, you know, we signed an agreement with Google a few years ago. And you'd have thought we'd been signing an agreement with the, you know, the, the communist and Nazi party together. <laughs> uh, it was that uh, huge controversy and fuss, and they were sending us money. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, and, and so it, and it's gotten a little bit worse on that, and, it, and it's, I think, as an agency, we need to fight hard to make these things easy. And, and to understand some of, somebody's not going to be happy about them, and you're just going to say, hey, that's our job. Our job isn't to make you happy. Our job is to do things that are new that move us forward. Thank you. Steve, any thoughts? It's hard to follow that <laughs> because Ames has been on the, uh, I guess, the bleeding edge of partnerships. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and uh, a pathfinder um, for, for partnerships. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the um, I think that um, you know, uh, reasonable people can come to the same reasonable conclusion with respect to how to move forward with something that's new and different. And uh, but the uh, you know the machinery can tend to really slow things down. Um, so that's something we're going to have to work on. Is um, you know, when I give talks to um, students, I talk about you know multidisciplinary activities, and. And, and they immediately think, well, it's aerospace engineering, and electrical engineering, and you know, mechanical engineering. But it's engineering, and law, and economic policy, and procurement policy, and partnership policy, and that, that's the really multidisciplinary thing that we need to get better at. Um, and the smart guys, the smart project guys, get the procurement officer and the CFO guys and the legal guys in on their project from day one and develop that multidisciplinary team to be successful moving forward. And, and we just need to do that more as an agency. Because I think, you know, like I said, I think people are, people absolutely want to do the right thing, but you need to kind of give them the freedom to do that. And I think we eventually get to the right answer. It's just getting there it can be awfully painful sometimes. And we have to figure out how to do it in a more efficient manner. Uh, a lot of times companies don't, you know, they can't wait six months for an answer. They need to know I in a couple of weeks in order to put their case together and be able to move on. And it, it doesn't always work out that way. You can take something simple like, you know, let's say I had a facility at KSC that I have absolutely no government use for, I and it's a pretty decent facility. And I don't have any money to maintain it. So, and I don't have the money to tear it down, so I don't have to maintain it. So it's just going to sit there and rot. But somebody else wants that facility, and they're willing to maintain it and upgrade it and care for it, and it won't cost the taxpayer a penny. You'd think that would be a pretty easy thing to do, but uh, there's a lot that you have to go through and a lot of people that have to be satisfi satisfied between GSA and, and everybody else in order to, to do something like that. So I think if we can figure out how to do things in a more efficient manner, and I totally agree with you, Steve, and even when you bring all those folks in ahead of time and pre-brief them and get them on board and say, yeah, that's a reasonable thing to do, it still doesn't always make it easy in the end. But eventually, you know, if it's the right thing to do, I believe the right thing will happen, and you just got to be persistent and work through it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Jean. Thanks. And that is something that we hear quite frequently, of course, at headquarters. Um, and those are for the companies who are willing to stick it out and work with us and continue on through all of this, these uh, challenges that you face in this timeline. Um, unfortunately, some companies just walk away. Uh, so we need, to, uh, we need to get better at that. And uh, there are a lot of folks interested in fixing that. So we just need to figure out how. Another question from our audience. Um, Bob, if you could start with this one. How do you keep your workforce engaged uh, during this current transition? Oh, they're absolutely engaged. Um, you know, I want to take all that energy that we poured into the shuttle for 30 years, making it successful, and now apply that to making the future happen. And, and we're doing that. And I saw things, I, I think it was uh, about eight months ago, you could see, really see uh, the team turn the corner toward making commercial space in the future happen. They got excited about a multi-user spaceport that, hey, you know, this could really be neat. If we make this work out and we got all this happening down here, that's really a, a good thing to do. So I think we've, we've got plenty to focus on uh, at KSC. Uh, 
I have to admit, it, it was a real challenge keeping the team motivated right up to the end when we, we knew so many were going to be out of work. But they were so focused on doing a good job. I mean, it's the quality of the workforce down there. They just really focused on that. And now everybody wants to make their transitioning, okay? And they can see that, hey, we can make the future good, all right? There are good things that can come from this, and we have to make this work. And they're pouring their energy into it. So I think it's, you have to, you have to have a clear vision of what you want the future to be and communicate that to the team and, and be persistent and get them to buy into it. And, uh, you know, they're doing that. Thank you. Anyone else? Jim? We're continually communicating with our workforce. We've had more uh, all-hands meetings in the last year than we probably had in the previous several years. But we knew the end of shuttle was coming. And we know that we're in a period of transition. Uh, commercial, the, the commercial aspects are new to, to our employees, and making them understand what that means has been a challenge. But when they see that they have the opportunity to work now in a development program with a commercial entity doing what they like to do, their partner isn't traditional, and the role isn't traditional, but they're doing the same type of work, and it's brand new work for them. That's extremely exciting to them, and they're beginning to understand this is a new environment, but they're still going to be the same type of propulsion work that they've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, another interesting question here. Um, is nuclear power required to make a variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket, the VASMIR, feasible for deep space missions? So, in other words, what are the prospects for space-based nuclear power in the foreseeable future? Anyone want to take that simple one on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, very interesting question. I mean, the, uh, uh, the, the challenge for NASA, I think, and this is, uh, is uh, as Lori Garver talked about this morning, is we need to be on the frontiers. And, and I think the, uh, the, the whole idea that increasingly the private sector will take care of the trucking to low Earth orbit, NASA should focus how to build a true spaceship. Uh, how do you get between worlds? To do that, uh, I think we need much more efficiency. Uh, and, and, uh, Charlie Bolden said this a few weeks ago. It, we need to figure out how to build faster rockets and, and, and more efficient ones. Uh, so that means you need to get more power and uh, more concentrated means and a more efficient uh, propellant. Uh, nuclear power is probably the, the most compact power source we know. Uh, on the other hand, it's not that easy to handle. So the challenge is, is can we develop compact nuclear power sources that can power these new electric propulsion systems that could get you to Mars in three months, uh, that you don't have to wait for the, for the, uh, uh, the right opposition and can get you throughout the entire, uh, entire solar system. That's going to happen. I think NASA is going to lead that. Uh, but to say that it has to be nuclear is, uh, is probably uh, uh, a bit of an exaggeration now. I, I'm very excited about solar concentrator arrays, the ability to use solar power uh, as solar systems become more efficient. Uh, I think there is a number of other options. But, but something like VASMR, uh, which is a, uh, a much higher specific impulse engine that has a fairly high thrust density, meaning that there's a lot of uh, that, that not only is it efficient, but you get a lot of oomph in the efficiency. Uh, it's a very technical term, oomph. Uh, <laughs> is uh, is, uh, is going to be required, and that's, that's going to be our challenge over the next decade or two is to develop that. Yeah, so, yeah I, I agree with Pete. I mean, we need to develop in-space propulsion technology to significantly reduce trip time or figure out how to deal with radiation effects and the long-term exposure of people in space. And so you can do that trade of trip time versus in-space propulsion capability, right? Um, so we're, we're, we're absolutely, we're absolutely going to need that. Uh, you know, VASMR was a technology we were working on way back when, which could paint nuclear. We absolutely, uh, I was on the human exploration framework team, and the, the, when we looked at design reference missions and technologies, nuclear propulsion was absolutely in the mix for the technology that you need to, to get, you know, get people between planets coupled with radiation protection, the other things that you need. Um, suspended animation was also in the mix, but mm. that was kind of a little farther out there. So anyway, but yeah, those, those technologies are absolutely going to be required to ultimately be our, our goal, which is people on the surface of Mars. Steve, I'm, I'm really old, and I've already had my kids. I'll go. <laughs> uh, the radiation's okay. 
also we also talked about the one-way trip to Mars, the reality TV show at, on Mars. You know, some innovative things. Particularly after we talked to Buzz, after Buzz got a hold of us, you know, we were sold on the one-way oh, trip. Absolutely, right? absolutely. <laughs> one-way trip for Buzz, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, our time is winding down. Uh, do any of our panelists have any final thoughts or additions? Well, I'd just like to say, uh, first off, it's a pleasure being here. But uh, this is critical to our future. I really believe we're at a turning point. Um, we can make this work. But the only way it's going to work is if we work together to make it work. And uh, it's not what we're doing isn't mutually exclusive between exploration and commercial space. Uh, I really believe they support one another. And I think uh, if we persevere through this and uh, work together, we're going to be successful because we don't have any other choice, okay? We have to make this work, and I think, uh, I think the partnerships are going to be key to making that happen. In the most simplistic terms, everything we've always done is hard, and this is going to be hard as well. Dogged determination is what we're all going to have to demonstrate in order to get through this, but we can. Yeah, I, I, you know, obviously, um, you know, in partnership, we can do way more than we can do um, by ourselves, and uh, we really need to leverage each other's uh, you know, intellectual um, capital, innovative ideas, capital, capital, uh, and other resources appropriately, and we, we can work together effectively to make this happen. Like I said, it's not an either-or proposition. We can, like Bob said, we can, uh, we can do some uh, really great things moving forward uh, in partnership. I really agree with everything that's been said here. It's, it's really important that, that we work together and we work with you. Uh, I do have one final sort of comment here, though, that, you know, when they talk about closing down centers, I just, the temperature today in Mountain View is 75 degrees. <laughs> in Virginia, 93. Uh, Houston, 94. <laughs> Cape Canaveral, 90. Huntsville, 95. Point taken. <laughs> Go Ames. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all so much. I always learn a lot when I talk to you, and I hope you all did as well. Thank you. We'll be now going to a networking break, which will go until 3.45, so about a half an hour, and then we'll begin with the government commercial roundtable. Thanks. Making that transformation and doing it effectively is, is the big goal at our center. Preserving the workforce that we have and the capability, not only as civil servant, but the contractor capability that we have in the community for propulsion systems. Building the partnerships with those developers, uh, the commercial developers that want to do engine work or, or booster work, and using capability that we've used over the years in Apollo and the shuttle program uh, the analytic capability, the, uh, the institutional infrastructure that we have, component test facilities, uh, test stands at different places, be able to use that now to help commercial as they begin to develop uh, their own versions uh, of engines, but use the capability that, that we have and the experience that we've garnered over the years and be able to make that transformation with those commercial entities. Great, thank you. And Steve, how about at Langley? All right, I'll try this one. <laughs> um, let's see. So, I mean, a few things. Okay, great. Okay, so a few things. First, um, you know, we definitely have some commitments in the next five years or so that we're really focused on and delivering on those commitments, both in the aeronautics research side, on exploration, and in, in science, too. So, for example, we're, um, you know, really doing a lot of great analysis and ground tests for environmentally responsible aviation to meet the goals of reducing fuel burn, reducing drag, reducing uh, noise, and reducing emissions. And we're, uh, gonna look, we're looking at several configurations now and hope to down-select to a, uh, you know, a, a configuration in the next year or so and really ring that out for the next generation you know, transport aircraft. 
Also, we're working really closely with AIMS on advanced concepts for more of a distributed air traffic management system to try to uh, get a more scalable ATM system by looking at uh, awareness and tools for the pilots in the cockpit, as well as ground controllers. And we'll be doing a joint experiment with AIMS in the next several years on that, and hopefully we'll transfer that technology, you know, eventually. Um, and the description is that the NASA will pay a vital, will play a vital role in the development of the commercial space sector. But what exactly can they do for commercial space? What do they plan to get from helping private companies? Leaders from some of the biggest NASA locations come together to give answers to these questions and discuss current developments at their, at their centers. The potential for government commercial partnerships and what role they see their centers playing in the future of commercial space. Uh, the moderator for today's panel is Rebecca Kaiser, or Rebecca Spike Kaiser, some people know her by, who is the Associate Deputy Administrator for Policy Integration at NASA. Thank you all. As, I, as we assemble our panel here, um, I'll just say a few opening remarks. Um, we are so privileged to have uh, center directors and deputy directors here, and to me this is a great sign for the importance of commercial space that we have such a prolific showing here uh, at, at this conference. I would like to draw your attention to a publication that just came out uh, that was published by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, called Space Economy at a Glance 2011. And in this publication, they do talk quite a bit about commercial space. Um, specifically, they say that there's been a growth in space-related entrepreneurial activity in the space industry, particularly in the United States. Despite the economic crisis, there are many companies pursuing the development of new commercial space operations, vying to transport cargo and passengers in suborbital and or orbital flights. The total investment committed to the commercial space flight es uh, industry is estimated at $1.46 billion in 2009 with over $300 million in new commitments since January of 2008. And th this investment is made up of 15% government money, 15%. Now, what do we want to be? What, do we, what can we do to enable commercial space? And our goal is to enable commercial space and be a multi-user spaceport where we have a a strong center with a good engineering team and uh, a ground ops team that can support multiple programs. It can support NASA's heavy lift program as well as multiple users out in Launch Complex 39. Uh, I think that is, uh, it's a huge challenge when you've had people that are so dependent on doing things one way. And what I told my team, you know, is that, uh, you know, in order to do something better, you have to change. And nobody likes change. They like they like what they have. So uh, I think the, the goal that I have, that we have as a center, and it's a NASA goal, and that's to enable commercial space operations. We have to make it work. You can argue, um, you know, that you may have wanted to do something different, or you might not have done what we did to get to where we are, or we're not doing the right thing, but the bottom line is we are where we are. And what happened in the past, we can't deal with that. We have to deal with where do we need to be in the future. And uh, right now, uh, th that's getting a capability to get crews to the International Space Station and not have to rely on our uh, Russian partners to do it with uh, uh, a U.S. rocket and a U.S. team. And that's what uh, the Commercial Crew Development Program is all about. So what we're working on at KSC is putting the infrastructure in, sp in place that will support and enable those commercial operations as well as uh, NASA's heavy lift exploration program, and the two are not mutually exclusive. They're compatible. They're very compatible, and we can make that work. So th that's the main goal we got right now. And then you got to throw in, you know, while well, we still got the launch services program, it's critical to procuring our uh, uh, rockets for our scientific payloads. Uh, we got one coming up here on August 5th, Juno, to, uh, to Jupiter. And uh, at the end of the year, well, you got GRAIL, and then we got uh, the Mars Science Lab. So 
you know, we want to continue to maintain the success we've had there. And, uh, and then you can throw on top of that uh, getting the ground infrastructure in place to support the uh, space launch system and the multi-purpose crew vehicle. So uh, those are the three goals that we have at KSC. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. Gene. I'll build some on what Bob said, but my 50 percent comes from what they call angel investors, 30 percent from private en equity, and 5 percent from reinvestment. So in my view, we're getting quite a bit of bang for our buck for 15 percent uh, government investment. And I think the future is growing and is quite bright. We have our centers here because this is where the rubber meets the road. Our partnerships are formed quite often at our NASA centers. This is where they're doing the real work. This is where they're going out and formulating these partnerships. And I think the fact that we have four directors and, and deputy directors here shows that this really is an active and important activity at each of these centers. So I would like to introduce on our far left Bob Cabana, who is the director of Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We have Gene Goldman, who is the deputy director of Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. We have Steve Jerzyk, who is the deputy director of Langley Research Center in Virginia. And we have Pete Warden, who is the director of Ames Research Center right here. The way we're going to structure this panel is I'm going to ask a series of questions. I encourage you all also to uh, submit questions, and I'll intersperse them with the questions that I ask. And we're going to focus again on the activities and efforts that are happening at the centers to enhance commercial partnerships. So I'd like to start out by asking a question to all of our panelists, and I'll go down the line, by first introducing what are the two to three main goals you have for your center in the next five to ten years overall. And I'd like to start with Bob. Well, I think now that uh, we've safely flown out the shuttle, uh, the main goal of the Kennedy Space Center is to transform to a multi-user launch complex. You know, we've been very dependent uh, upon large government programs in the past, Apollo, Skylab, shuttle, and uh, inherent within each of those programs with all the infrastructure, the engineering support, everything, uh, and it was all paid for by that one program, and that kind of covered the whole center. Uh, as we move to the future, you know, what we have to look at is, you know, to the FAA. Um, so in the exploration side, we leave the launch abort system, and uh, we continue to uh, refine that design and have a, te you know, a test flight coming up, hopefully, um, to do a scent abort, um, and that's a really critical test flight for that system. So we're always focused on delivering our commitments. The second thing is we've been on a journey um, over the last three or four years at Langley in kind of reinv reinvigorating innovation within the center. Um, so we, did, we were doing a lot of good research and a lot of good technology development, a lot of good invention, but that's not necessarily innovation, where you're applying that research and technology to solving problems and developing new capabilities. So we were looking at that, that's kind of the goal of the new space technology program, is not to develop, do research and just develop widgets, but to develop systems um, for capabilities that we need in the future. And so that's been critical for us. We're getting a little insular at the center and not looking at what was going on, not only within the country, but worldwide. Um, you know, more than the majority of the research done in this country now is outside of government. And over half the research in the world is done, a, a large majority of the research in the world is done outside of this country. So we're trying to open it up and look at how we can combine other research and technologies with our research technology to develop innovative new systems and also innovate at the systems level. Um, new configurations that, uh, even old configurations that could not be realized in the past but can be realized now with the application of new technologies. That's the second thing. And the third thing is we're trying to look out a little bit farther and uh, really look at what you know, might be the new breakthroughs that could uh, give us new capabilities in the future. So we developed things that are sort of like grand challenges at the center. They're called revolutionary technical challenges. And uh, they, they're doing with those is try to put big goals out there, like for example, significantly reduce the uh, cost of a, a pound of payload to low Earth orbit, and really look at what configurations, what technologies can enable that in the 10, 15, 20 year time frame so that we'll be prepared as we move forward to, uh, 
to, to advance uh, in that example spaceflight. Excellent, thanks. And Pete at Ames. Well, uh, Ames is uh, sometimes referred to as the uncenter. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so probably our first objective.